So I first went to the Philippines, that's when I'd started consulting, this would be about the late 90s, sorry, the late 70s, 1978, and, um, and I went there for the, for the Australian arm of goldfields of South Africa, and they had an office in London, of course, at that time, but it was the Australian arm that um, I went up there initially well, that's yeah. That's that, that's that, that's an interesting story as well, because by working at Bajo Lab de Lambreo, we, we we realized there that this this had a high gold content in it. Um, very difficult to get a get a low grade gold assay back in back in those days, but there was we all knew from the literature that um, CRA uh, had discovered Panguna in Bougainville Island of just just to the east there of Papua New Guinea, and that this was a, 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 a gold-rich porphyry copper, and a lot of the revenue had only just gone into production, a lot of the revenue was coming from gold. But the gold grade was always, always reported in the literature as penny weights. And I remember being up in northwestern Argentina trying to determine what the hell a penny weight was. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we finally managed to translate it into grams and realized that Bajo de la Lambrera had the same amount of gold in as Panguna did. So there was a lot of, a lot of excitement that ensued then because it was obviously a, a, potentially a revenue stream. This was prior to the gold, gold price increasing in 1979, of course. We're still in the mid-70s. And then I got to work um, also on a UN project at Sandak in, in, um, in westernmost Pakistan, in Baluchistan, right where Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan come together. So I spent three months in a tent. Out so this there, is circa Rekodik, is it? Yeah, west of Rekodik, near yeah. near the near the Iranian border, and that was also gold rich. So we started to started to realise that um, there was a, this linkage between magnetite in these systems and the systems being being, being gold bearing. So. And we could see different levels of gold in these systems. So I thought, well, there must be gold-rich end members of these things. So that's why I went to the Philippines, because there, there, there were several porphyry copper golds known and reported in the Philippines at that time. So I managed to get um, gold fields to, to support a trip out there so that I could wander around. And, and they were very keen, they were looking for gold. And so we, we mounted a program that was looking for the gold rich end member. And you wrote a paper with Gape. Oh that no that came that, that was later. That, that was later, later yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so that was um, we, we at the bottom line of all that, we never found the we never found the gold rich end member. And and of course that that turned up quite unexpectedly when um, in the late eighties I was involved on, a, on an Anglo-American Cominco joint venture in what is now the Maricunga Belt, looking for another, another El Indio Bonanza grade high sulfidation gold silver vein. Um, and the, one of the, or several of the alteration zones suddenly realized these are, gold, these are porphyry gold deposits, essentially no copper in them. So what I thought that we, we would find in Southeast Asia ended up being found in the middle of the Andes in a place that nobody ever thought was even mineralized, let alone containing porphyry. Deposits. And Anglo had a great camp up there, didn't they? They, they Anglo had a, had a they, they, Anglo knew how to do exploration up there. Yeah. And uh, that was just when, we're talking about late 80s, early 90s, that's when these um, commercial catering companies for field camps just started to be set up. And they had different levels of service. And um, an Anglo-American knew that they had to take care of their people, so they had the top level of service, which meant that you'd come back from the field, have a nice hot shower, go into the living room, and there'd be a, a uniformed waiter with a tray of pisco sours and canapes before dinner. Because so, you, you, you set you, or you and Anglo between you arranged for that for, on that field trip. Do you recall? Well, that was 1991, yeah. I think it wasn't it, 1991 yeah. or. Yeah, 19, no, the SEG, SEG field trip. That's right, we, well, we went through the Santa Cecilia camp. Um, we actually stayed there, didn't we? We did, the Santa yeah. Cecilia camp and got, and so you, you experienced the full treatment there. We certainly did, yes. And when you think now, in the Andes, there's probably not a single field camp where you can get a beer. All the camps are dry. Yeah. 